Crash Course Chemistry, where we'll go over the main topics from Dr. Lavelle's Chemistry 14A curriculum. The most fundamental part of any chemical reaction is balancing the equation. Balancing the equation demonstrates the law of conservation of mass. The number of moles of each atom in the reaction should be equal on both sides. For example, if we have hydrogen gas reacting with nitrogen gas to produce ammonia, we have to add in the coefficients 3 and 2 to ensure that there are the same numbers of hydrogen atoms and nitrogen atoms on both sides of the re reaction. When solving for percent yield, look out for the limiting reactant. If we have one mole of nitrogen and two moles of hydrogen, hydrogen would be the limiting reactant and leave an excess of nitrogen. When dealing with the photoelectric effect, you'll be given a light source that's shining a radiation onto a metal. When the energy of this radiation reaches a certain threshold, you'll have enough energy to emit an electron from the surface of the metal. If the electron is traveling at a velocity, you know you'll have a kinetic energy that can be found with the equation Ek equals 1 half mv squared. The photoelectric effect demonstrates the law of conservation of energy because the total energy from the radiation, which is given by E equals Planck's constant H times frequency, is equivalent to the sum of the threshold energy, which is just the amount of energy it takes to emit the electron, plus the kinetic energy, or the amount of energy it takes for that electron to travel at a certain velocity. Heisenberg uncertainty equation is the uncertainty in momentum times the uncertainty in position must be greater than or equal to Planck's constant divided by 4 pi. Delta P and delta X are inversely related. The more certain you are of one, the less certain you can be of the other. Remember to double the radius of the atom to get delta X. When dealing with molecular shape and structure, it's important to remember that regions of high electron density repel one another. Thus, the shape is determined by the optimization and distance between regions of electron density. One thing to keep in mind are the varying levels of the strengths of repulsion. The strongest repulsions are those between two lone pairs, followed by repulsions between a lone pair and a bonding pair. The weakest repulsion is that between two bonding pairs. This explains why bond angles are slightly reduced when there's a lone pair present. When trying to draw a molecular orbital diagram, first start with drawing the atomic orbital diagrams for the two individual atoms. Then you can draw the molecular orbital di diagram for the diatomic molecule. Remember that the total number of electrons in the two individual atoms must equal the total number of electrons in the diatomic molecule. For each atomic orbital, there is a corresponding bonding and antibonding orbital. The bonding or orbital is lower in energy than the original orbital, and thus it stabilizes the molecule. However, the antibonding orbital is higher in energy than the original orbital and thus destabilizes the molecule. We can use this diagram to figure out the bond order of this molecule. We can use the equation 1 half the number of bonding electrons minus the number of antibonding electrons. For O2, that would be 8 bonding electrons minus 4 antibonding electrons to get a bond order of 2 when you divide that by 2. It's important to remember that the higher the bond order, the stronger the bond and the shorter the bond length. We can also look at a diagram to figure out whether the molecule is diamagnetic or paramagnetic. O2 is paramagnetic because its highest two electrons are unpaired and parallel in spin. When naming coordination compounds, there's a certain order you need to follow. First, you want to name the ligands in alphabetical order with their Greek prefixes. Next, you want to name the transition metal, followed by its oxidation number, and finally, add the word ion if the complex is a charge and there's no counter ion. Otherwise, write the name of the counter ion at the end, and you don't need a Greek prefix. So we have an example here of tetraamine, dihydroxo, chromium-3, bromide. So you see that we've gone in alphabetical order, starting with A and then to hydroxo, which starts with an H, and um, disregarded the Greek prefixes in relation to alphabetizing the ligands. And um, we have the word bromide because there is, in fact, a counter ion present. 
Um, so some things to keep in mind are you want to add the suffix eight onto the transition metal if the complex has a negative charge. But it's also important to remember that iron, iron becomes ferrite and copper becomes cuprate. And that is the end of our crash course. We hope that that helps you and good luck on your final exams.